Everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh man, welcome to day 18. What day is it? I'm like losing count. Day 17. Why do I think it was day 18? Welcome to day 17 of Holy 13. We are here. We are ready. We are ready. Good morning. Come on, come on. Good morning. Um, I hope everybody had a good, restful night. You know? And you're ready to just get into the word this morning. First thing, Saturday morning, getting into the word. Um, yeah, yeah, and just getting that in there, you know. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm excited. I'm very excited to be here. And so we're not going to waste time. We're not going to waste time. We're going to get right into it. Just a uh, thumbs up. If you can hear me well, if there's no problem, um, thumbs up if you can hear me well, well, and there's no problem with like the sound or anything. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad. Well, well, well. All right. So good morning. Welcome to day... 17 of holy 30 we are here and we're ready um we're just gonna immediately get into a time of prayer and and just really come to a place of like surrender and just praying that god you know what we took the time we woke up um like meet us here you know let's take some time to pray and say god we took the time we woke up this morning we are intentional about seeking you we are intentional about hearing from you god please meet us here god please come and like just do what only you can do so let's just take some time to pray and ask for the presence of the holy spirit and ask that god does what only he can do like be intentional about this time let this time actually really mean something um yeah man if you're sleeping if you're in bed i really encourage you to actually get up and sit up like actually put intention behind what you are doing back what you are doing with intention um because the holy spirit is here we're all like here showing up so i pray that you also at the same time show up with intention like get out of bed um sit up take your bible take your notebook like be ready to engage in what god is doing and so um let's take some some minutes and just really really pray just pray say lord i'm here there's many troubles there's many things that are troubling my mind there's many worries in this life, but God, in this moment, I just want to seek you and I just want to hear from you and God come and do what only you can do. So let's take a couple of minutes and pray and then we'll get into the word. Heavenly Father, Lord, we've come before you this morning, mighty Father God. Heavenly Father, we've come before you to just seek you, Lord God. We've come to seek your face this morning, mighty Father God. Heavenly Father, we trust and believe that your presence is in this place, mighty Father God. We trust that you are working in this place, oh God. Heavenly Father, this morning we have no other intention but to seek you. We have no other intention but to hear from you, Lord. We have absolutely no other intention, oh God, but to get to know you and know your face, mighty Father God. Heavenly Father, we pray in this moment as we've taken the time, mighty Father God, as we walk in up, Lord God, and put the 
intention to seek you, you mighty Father God. Heavenly Father, we pray that you come into this space and meet us, mighty Father God. Heavenly Father, come and meet us at our point of need, Lord God. Holy Spirit, you are more than welcome in this space. You are more than welcome to come and do what only you desire to do, oh God. Heavenly Father, I pray in this moment that we may have so many things in our minds. We may have so many things happening in our lives. There might be so much confusion. There might be so much chaos in our heads, Lord God. But in this moment, God, I just speak a peace that surpasses all understanding, mighty Father God. Let your peace rule over us as we are seeking you this moment. Let your peace reign over us as we've come before you this morning to seek you, Father God. Heavenly Father, I pray right now in this moment just for your presence, Lord God, more than anything else, mighty Father God. For if we're doing this without you, Lord God, then what's the point? Mighty Father God, we don't want to do this if it's outside of you. We don't want to do this if you won't be in it, mighty Father God. Heavenly Father, it is you that we want, mighty Father God. Everything that we do is that perhaps one day we will get to see you. We will get to meet the one, mighty Father God, who truly saved our souls. Lord God, I pray in this moment that you just step into the room. Step into every space right now, mighty Father God. Step into every room, mighty Father God, and do what only you can do. Lord, there is no distance in the realm of the spirit mighty father god to heavenly father right now i trust and believe that wherever everybody is you are moving you are working you are shifting things oh god heavenly father i pray for every single heart right now lord god let our hearts be ready ground ready ground ready soil ready to receive your word mighty father god let our hearts be ready to receive your word let our our hearts be fertile soil that when your word lands as a seed it grows lord god Lord God, I pray in this moment, this morning, let your word come and change and transform us. Convict us through your word, mighty Father God. You said your word is a living and a breathing, sharper than any double-edged sword. Lord God, I pray that your word penetrates to the bone and marrow this morning, Lord God. That your word divides, Lord God, and checks the intentions of our hearts, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, I just pray this morning that we will not be the same. That every person present here, every person who's going to watch this, mighty Father God, that at the end they will not be the same, Lord God, I pray that this will be transformative and ultimately this will lead us closer to you and make us more and more like Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that even as I speak this morning, let it only be you that is speaking, Father. Let it be you. May I decrease as you increase, Father God. Let it be you that is heard and seen. Disrupt anything planned. Disrupt anything, mighty Father God, just for you to move. Lord, I pray this and I pray for everybody that is present. I pray for peace. I come against any distractions, mighty Father. God, I know that we will be here listening to what you are saying. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. We give you all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Oh, amen. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, amen, amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Um, so let's, let's, let's get right into it. Um, we are in Acts, the book of Acts and Acts chapter 16 today. Acts 15. Acts chapter 15. Right. Okay. We're in Acts chapter 15 today and we are here. <laughs> Yesterday we did Acts chapter six, chapter fourteen, and we spoke about uh, Paul and Barnabas. Yesterday was really good, guys. The Bible study is actually up on YouTube, and we were speaking about idols and putting man in the place of God, and it was really really good. We spoke about Paul and Barnabas when they were in Lystra and they were preaching there, and they healed someone, and because they healed someone, people started sacrificing to them and making them gods or putting them in the place of god and so we kind of went into that the bible studies up on youtube i had a good time like i've been actually having a good time for the last couple of chapters because it's getting juicier by the second so yeah i think that was really great today we're in x chapter 15 and we're going to speak about circumcision of the heart circumcision of the heart this is close to home okay because girl i've been in it <laughs> you know um so yeah today we're speaking about circumcision of the heart and we'll be in acts chapter 15 so if you're taking notes 
but speaking about circumcision of the heart and we're in acts chapter 15 so we'll get right into it um we'll start from verse one i'll read verse one to five and then we'll kind of dive into that and then get into the rest of it so acts chapter 15 verse one to five says certain people came down from judea to antioch and were teaching the believers unless you are circumcised according to the customs taught by moses you cannot be saved this brought paul and barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them so paul and barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question the church sent them on their way and as they traveled through phoenicia and samaria they told how the gentiles had been converted this news made all the believers very glad when they came to jerusalem they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything god had done through them and then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the pharisees stood up and said the gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So what we see happening here is that Paul and Barnabas, remember they've been going along all these cities, all these regions, preaching the gospel, even to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are now receiving the word and are believing. The Gentiles are coming to know Jesus Christ. But because people don't like to see the gospel winning, some people then come to those places where Paul and Barnabas are preaching and say, hey, we know people have been preaching Jesus and preaching freedom, we say, according to the law of Moses, if you are not circumcised, then you cannot be a child of God. So they come and they bring um, religion to burden the people, right? They bring religion to come and burden these people. And then they say, you know what, you haven't found freedom. You haven't found Jesus. You haven't been saved. That You are not living in salvation unless you observe these religious practices. And it's the same with us, right? Sometimes people really want to come to God, but then we put so many religious practices in their way that we make it even more difficult for people to actually experience the freedom that is Christ. It doesn't make sense for Jesus to say um, that we've been set free through him. Right? It doesn't make sense for the Bible to say um, it is for freedom that we've been set free. But then for the church to stand and say, well, we have these religious practices that feel more burdensome than they do feel like freedom. Right? We have the church putting in place a lot of these things that like, if you're not this and this and this and this and that, then you cannot be walking in the fullness of who God has called you to be. There are certain things, yes, that the church places in order to run smoothly as an organization. That makes sense because it has to run, you know, and it ha there has to be order. But let us not get to a point where as a church we prioritize organization and order over people actually walking in genuine freedom. I've met people and said with people who say, listen, I want to do church. I want to do life with Jesus. But when I look at church activities it feels more burdensome than actually walking in the freedom of Jesus Christ, right? They're like, I look at all the things that I have to do at church and before church and all these things, and that doesn't feel like I'm walking in freedom. That doesn't feel like I am free. It just feels like I have to observe so many other practices so that I'm able to somewhat be called a child of God and identify as a Christian. And this is exactly what's happening in the church, right here in the book of Acts. People are finding Jesus and they're devoted to Jesus. They're not denying Jesus. They're not denying the ways of Jesus. They are finding him, they're devoted to his ways. But then you find these religious people who come with the law and come to oppress. The Bible says in the book, book of Romans that the law doesn't bring anything. It brings death, right? It's burdensome. Hence grace, hence Jesus came and brought about grace so that we are actually set free and walking in freedom. So that's what we see happening here in the church. So Paul and Barnabas are like, yes, we get that. And Paul and Barnabas were circumcised and all these things. They're like, yes, we get that. But Jesus did not preach circumcision, physical circumcision, right? Jesus did not preach physical circumcision. Jesus preached a change of heart. So why is it that when Jesus preached a change of heart, we should then come and put in a law 
right? The Bible says, Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law of Moses. So if the law has been fulfilled, why is it then that other people still need to walk under that law? Why are we still burdening people with that very same law that has been fulfilled? Why are we still burdening people with things that don't necessarily really bring them closer to Jesus? It's just so that they can take it off a box. Right, and you find like you join a church or something or like a organization or whatever, and there are these checkpoints that you have to take before they are like, Yeah, now you're a Christian. And it's like, Why can I not be a follower of Christ before I tick all these boxes? Why can I not be identified as a child of God even outside of ticking all these boxes? Right? Even outside of doing A, B, C, D, E, E. Like, why can I not be? Even if I don't look like a Christian, even if I don't sound like a Christian, why can I not be a child of God simply by believing in Him and by having a change of heart? And when people have truly experienced Jesus and the freedom of Jesus Christ, all these religious and church activities flow from that place. They really do flow from... You'll find people who have absolutely no problem serving in the house of God and doing the things of God and showing up because they've experienced Jesus and it's never about the church anymore. It's never about fulfilling any sort of law. They just serve because they've experienced the freedom that is Jesus Christ. And that should be our point and our aim as a church and as the body of Christ to lead people to the point where they experience Jesus and find true freedom in Jesus. And from there, everything else will flow from that place of experiencing Jesus Christ. So like, where does this idea of circumcision come from? Because here they're saying, hey, unless these people are circumcised, according to the law then you know so where does this come from we find the origin of the circumcision in genesis chapter 17 genesis 17 verse 10 to 14 genesis 17 verse 10 to 14 uh i'm gonna read it it says this is my cover this is god speaking to abraham right god is speaking to abraham genesis chapter 10 Genesis 17, sorry, Genesis 17, verse 10 to 14. Genesis 17, 10 to 14. Okay, this is God speaking to Abraham. And he says, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generation. He, will, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So we see the origin of this circumcision, right? Um, sorry. God enters into a covenant with Abraham, an everlasting covenant, right? And say, hey, listen, I'm going to give you many nations. We're going to build an everlasting covenant. What you and I have going on is going to be generational. It's going to be everlasting. But in order, in order for people to take part in this covenant, in order for generations after you to take part in this covenant, they have to be circumcised. So the circumcision is a mark, one, that these people belong to me, and two, it, is a, it allows them to take part in the promise that you and I have made. So this is the origin of the idea of circumcision, right? It's that, okay, because I'm circumcised, I am taking part in the covenant that God made with Abraham. So that that riches, that father of many nations, that promised land, all those things, I get to share in on that because I am circumcised. So that's the origin of the circumcision. It's basically saying, hey, listen, I'm a child of God. Like I can be from anywhere. Because it says even the Gentiles who are working in your house, you circumcise them so that they become my people and they can share in on this covenant. So it's about taking part 
in the covenant that God has with Abraham. But Jesus came to establish a new covenant, right? Jesus came to establish a new covenant. So the tradition of circumcision, right, was still submitting under the ways and the law of Moses and not submitting under the new covenant that Jesus came to establish. Because Jesus' covenant was freedom and grace and for us to have eternal life. That's the new covenant that he came to establish. And the shedding of his blood on the cross marked that covenant. And for us to share in on that covenant is simply believing in his blood. As if it were our blood that was shed. Is believing in his death as if we were the ones who died. Right? Back then, in order to get into a covenant, there had to be blood shed. There has to be blood shed. And so Jesus stands in our place shedding the blood as the lamb, as the sacrificial lamb. And then we get to share in on everything that is Jesus Christ. So there is no need anymore for physical circumcision. Because we are in a new covenant and Jesus has established a new covenant And you see this, there are people or there are Pharisees in this moment who are circumcised but have nothing to do with God. Who are circumcised but are not walking with God. There are many people, even within the body of Christ, who observe religious practices and activities but have absolutely nothing to do with God. Who God is like, I don't even know you. Who will get to the end days and say, Lord, Lord, and God is like, I don't know you. The Bible says, you will say, I prophesied in your name. I healed the sick in your name. I did this and this. I did all the religious activities in your name. And God will say, I don't know you. Because it's not about the physical. It's not about just observing the laws. It's not about just observing the practices. It's about actually having a change of heart. Going to church, serving at church does not make you a Christian. Because anybody can go in and take care of the kids. Anybody can go in and pick up the chairs. Going to church and doing all these things and going to morning prayer and doing all these activities. Do they edify your faith? They do. But that's not what makes you a Christian. That's not what makes... That has to flow from a changed heart. A heart that is fixed on God and that is transformed and turned around. But those are not the things that make you a child of God. The works that we do are not what make us children of God. We don't work to earn salvation. Paul says we don't work to earn salvation lest we boast and say it was by our own doing that we are saved. But he says it is by grace through faith that you have been saved so that no one can boast because grace is from God and God alone. And he's the only one who can extend grace. But it is that grace that has to come and transform your heart and you having faith in God that is what makes you a child of God. That is what allows you to share in on the covenant. You're not blessed because you are picking up chairs on Saturday at church. You're not blessed because you're cleaning the church. You are blessed because you believe in Jesus Christ. Your blessing comes from the place of the person who you believe in. You are blessed because you've placed your faith in Jesus and have allowed him to transform your heart That is why you are blessed. You are not blessed because you sing on the worship team. I mean, yeah, it helps. It's sacrifice. God requires sacrifice. But that's not why you are blessed. That's not why you're a child of God. You're a child of God because you believe in the finished work of the cross. And so seeing as there are these religious Pharisees who still don't believe in Jesus Christ, but they are circumcised, the apostles begin to advocate for a different kind of circumcision, right? We read in Acts chapter 15 from verse 6, Acts 15 from verse 6, it says, The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them, Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. He purified their hearts by faith. Now then, 
why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen temple. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore, that the Lord, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God, right? So we see the apostles now advocating for a different kind of circumcision. They say, listen, it is by faith that we receive the Holy Spirit. It is by faith that we are saved. We're not saved because we are circumcised. It is by faith that these things have happened to us. And so we know that God accepts the Gentiles too, because when we went to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, they were also filled with the Holy Spirit. It is by faith. And Peter here speaks about a change of heart. He speaks about a change of heart. And that's the kind of circumcision that God is after, that God really wants and that he requires. He speaks about a change of heart until our hearts are changed and turned around. And then that's when we can fully experience the fullness of God. A circumcision of the heart is what needs to happen, not the religious activity. Peter says here, listen, you are putting yokes on the necks that even you cannot carry. You are asking people to live up to a standard that even you cannot live up to. You are asking people to do things that you, even our ancestors, failed. Peter says the forefathers, all of them, everybody, the great Moses that you speak of, even he couldn't live up to said covenant. And you are asking people, you are burdening people with the yoke of those things. That even you right now, if you ask you, are you living up to these things? No. Even you are burdened by these things. Even you don't find true joy anymore. Even you are literally not having a good time observing these religious practices. But somehow you are wanting the next person to live up to things that you cannot live up to. And I really pray that as a church, as we continue to evangelize and reach out to people and new people begin to join the church, that we really don't let these things they're important, but we don't let these many, many things get in the way of people actually finding true freedom in Jesus. I really, really hope and pray that that's our goal as a church. But here the apostles speak of a different kind of circumcision. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. It says, um... And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. That is, he will remove the desire to sin from your heart so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul so that you may live as a recipient of his blessing. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart so that you will love the Lord your God. Right? God here is speaking. He says, I will circumcise your heart so that you will know how to love me, so that you will know how to walk the way that I want you to walk, so that you will be a recipient of my blessing. I have to circumcise your heart in order for you to share in on that blessing, share in on the covenant of Christ. There has to be a circumcision of the heart. There has to be a change of heart. Your heart needs to be transformed. You have to let your heart turn around. And as I was in prayer last night and busy preparing for this, I really had such a, a burden. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6. As I was, I was praying yesterday and in, in preparation for this, I was really, 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 really kind of like burdened, you know, as I was spending time with God. And God just said to me, Let my people are hurt. My people are burdened by so many things. 
that have nothing to do with me, but they've been told that this is how they can find me. And so my people can't even come to know me and find me because they are burdened by so many other things that they've been told. My people are even afraid to come and pursue me because they've been told so many other things that need to happen before I can visit, before I can come into their heart. Right? And God is like, I've made it so easy. I've made it so easy. Just believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. And then he's, he resides in your heart. He's like, I've made it so easy, so easy for my people to, to, to know me. I've made it so easy for my people to experience me, but nearly to my people are burdened by the things that they hear, by the things that they are told they need to do in order to have me live in their hearts. And God is like, I only require one thing. Just let me in. Let me come and circumcise your heart. And as I've circumcised your heart, you will know how to love me. If you don't know how to love God, if you don't know how to serve God, God says, listen, just let me circumcise your heart so that you may know how to love me. So that you may know before you are burdened by prayers for hours, before you are burdened by serving, before you are burdened by all these many, many, many other things, before all those things come and feel like a burden, can I just come and touch your heart? And that is God's plea. He says, before you feel like, oh my days, I have to do this and do this and do this or else I'm not a Christian. Can I just come and touch your heart? Can I just come and touch your heart? Because he's made it so easy. It doesn't get easier than this. He's made it so easy. Simple belief and confession. And that's it. And that's it. And freedom is yours. Salvation is yours. Victory is yours. Joy, peace, love. All these things are yours by mere confession and belief. Yes, it's important for us to stay in prayer, to stay in the word, because these things are our sustenance, right? They help us stay alive. They're like The word of God is like bread that we eat for us to stay alive. It's important. Prayer is important because we have to communicate with God and we have to grow. But he says in reality, before all those things, before all those things, can I just come and touch your heart? Before you, people now don't identify as Christians because they can't pray for five hours. Because they can't spend hours in the word. They feel like I am not worthy. I'm not worthy to be called a child of God. I'm not worthy to be called a Christian because I can't pray in tongues. I'm not just serving a church. I'm not just doing this thing. So therefore I'm not. And Jesus is like, I've made it so easy. I've made it so easy. Just let me come into your heart and I will teach you how to love me. I will teach you how to pray. I will teach you how to read your word. I will teach you how to serve. But let me first come and touch your heart. And Jesus says, there is so much happening in your heart. There is so much hurt, so much brokenness. You are confused. You are lost. I don't want you to go into these prayer warrior modes without me first healing the brokenness in your heart without me first touching what is happening in your heart because you will get more hurt you will become more bruised the church will hurt you if i haven't changed your heart first to love me before you love anything else God wants us to love him before we love any other thing that comes with being in his house he says, I want you to love me first so that even when all these other things happen, you can still stand firm because you know me and you loved me and I've circumcised your heart to love me. But a lot of us turn away because we've fallen, we, we've committed first to the church, we've loved the church, we've like burdened ourselves with things of God before we loved God himself, before God actually changed our hearts. And so even when we get hurt at church, we believe that that is God and turn away from God. And God is like, let me circumcise your heart first. 
So that even when the world hurts you, even when my people hurt you, because they will. He's like, let me circumcise your heart first. So even when my people hurt me, you know how to love me as God. You stay in love with me as God because you know it's about me and you and never about everything else around you. Everything flows from that place. Everything we do has to flow from the place of loving God. We cannot do everything in order to say that, oh yeah, now I love God. Everything has to flow from that place of having been circumcised, our hearts being changed and loving God. And that's what the disciples are advocating for here. They are advocating for a change of heart. They're saying if these people believe by faith and their hearts are changed, There is no need for us to burden them by these religious activities because they will do, they will literally do, and these people will do anything we'll tell them to do. That's what's happening. Because if you read further, they send them a letter and they tell them, stay away from this and this and this and this. And these people are glad and they observe, right? So these people, they will serve. They will do this because their hearts have been transformed and their hearts have been circumcised to love God before anything else. And that's what Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 tells us. That's what God says in Deuteronomy 30 verse 6. He says, let me circumcise your heart so that you can know how to love me. Let me circumcise your heart. We don't know how to love God. On our own accord, on our own merit, we don't know how to love God. It is because of his love and how he works in us that we're able to love him. The Bible says we love because he first loved us. Until we, we really fully understand that he first loved me. I love him because he first. I love him because he, he took the first step. And I can follow his example and love him back. How gracious is our God that he saves us. And then he says, because you still don't know how to love me, I'm going to teach you how to love me. Because you don't know, you don't know how to love me. You don't know how to love me. But because I want, I want you so bad, I love you so much, I'm going to teach you how to love me. And it starts there. All these things that we want to do, like, oh, I don't know how to read the word. I don't know how to do this. It's first coming to God and saying, God, teach me how to love you. Because I can read the Bible and not love you. And even begin to to build some sort of resentment towards God. Because we say, God, you're saying I must read the Bible and do these things and do these things. But right now life is hectic and I can't. And that's what happens, right? You're like, God, right now life is crazy and I can't read the word. I can't. And we start to build some sort of resentment towards God. Because we feel like it's these things that make us love God and that make God approve of us. Right, And God is like, let me teach you how to love me. Let me show you that this is a relationship and goes beyond all these things. These things help. But let me show you that it's about me living in your heart and me loving you and you learning how to love me back. That it's not so very complicated. That we don't have to go through so, so, so many religious activities. Let me teach you. Let me teach you how to love me. Let me teach you how to love me. Let me circumcise your heart so that you can love me. And so we read further in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 verse um, 28. Romans chapter 2 verse 28 to 29. Um, Let me just quickly find it. Mm, Just give me a second. Romans 2, 28 to 29. It says, For he is not a real Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external and physical, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and true circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the law. His praise is not from men, but from God. 
his praise is not from men but from god's true circumcision is circumcision of the heart and it says the one who performs the circumcision is not a man but it's the spirit of god that comes to perform the circumcision it's the spirit of god that comes to really cause a change of heart not men it is not men that can cause us change our heart. It is only the spirit of God. And that is why the Bible tells us that we must die to our flesh and live according to the spirit. Because as we live according to the spirit, he is the one that continually changes our heart and develops our character to make us more like Jesus Christ. And he says, this person, his praises are not from men, but from God. Sorry, you do a heart check and ask yourself, is my heart truly transformed? And how do I know this? Where does my validation come from? Where does my validation come from? Is my validation coming from man? Do I thrive on the praises of man? If I thrive on the praises of men, that means I've been circumcised by men or I'm looking for circumcision from men. For an outward circumcision. If my validation comes from the praises of men, it's, still, it's because I do outward actions so that men can see that I'm changed and I'm a child of God. And that is why when men praise me, that's where I found, find validation. Because I do what I do for the praises of men. We do a hard check and say, where does my source of approval, who is my source of approval? Where does my validation come from? If I'm still waiting for man to approve of me, it means that I'm still subjecting myself under the law and under physical circumcision because it is only physical circumcision that man can see. We don't see the small decisions that you make. We don't necessarily see the change in character that the Holy Spirit is doing. We don't see what the Holy Spirit is doing. But I can see when you are preaching. I can see when you are at church serving. I can see when you are doing all these other activities and be like, wow, that person is on fire for God. And if that's what you thrive off of, then you are still subjecting yourself under the law. You are performing for the audience of many. When God has called us to perform for the audience of one, which is him, and he should be our true source of validation. What happens when God asks you to do the things that no one can see? Are we reluctant because we know men won't be able to clap hands for us? Or do we do it wholeheartedly because we say, Father, my praise comes from you. My, my source of validation is you, God. You are the only one that I live for because you are the only one that has changed my heart. You are the only one that knows the condition of my heart. We don't know the condition of your heart. We can see you serving and doing all these things, but we don't know the condition of your heart. It is only God that knows. And so a heart check or to ask yourself, have I been circumcised by the Holy Spirit is saying, who is my source of validation? Who am I performing for? Who am I living for? Am I performing for the audience of one, which is God? Or am I still seeking the validation of man? Am I still living outwardly so that I can feel good inwardly? Instead of feeling good inwardly with God, and letting that flow outwardly. Because that's what God calls us to. God calls us to a place of, hey, you have been approved. I have saved you. I have done all these things. Work from that place of, of love and of approval and all these things. And then you are able to do the work that I've sent you for. But if we're doing the work for people's approval so that we can feel good on the inside, we're still subjecting ourselves to the law. It's like Jesus came and freed us of that burden and we take the chains and put it back on ourselves and say, Jesus, thank you for the cross, but this chain I'd like to keep. This chain I'd like to keep because I'm not performing for the audience of one. I am performing for the audience of many. 
That's exactly what we do. When we still fight so hard for outward circumcision instead of yielding our hearts and allowing God to circumcise us inwardly. And that's what Paul says here in the book of Romans. He says a Jew is not one who is circumcised outwardly, but one whose heart has been circumcised by the Holy Spirit. One whose heart has been circumcised by the Holy Spirit. And so we read further in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. Colossians 2, verse 11 to 12. Paul is writing to the church in Colossus. Colossa, and he says, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands, right? But by the spiritual circumcision of Christ in the stripping off of the body of the flesh, having been buried with him in baptism, raised with him to a new life through your faith in the working of God as displayed when he raised Christ from the dead. Paul here is saying, You've been circumcised. Not with hands, but it's a spiritual circumcision and has come through your faith. Again, to that simplicity of saying, hey, it is quite simple. It is your belief and your faith in God that has allowed you to take part in this covenant. It is your belief. It is not a human circumcision. It's a spiritual circumcision, a change of heart spiritually That has allowed you, because as you believe in Jesus Christ, you've died with him and are resurrected with him. And now you have a new life, new heart. It's a spiritual circumcision. It's a spiritual circumcision. It's a change of heart. And that's what the apostles are advocating for here and saying, hey, listen, God is a God of all, all who will believe. We've read a couple times so far in the book of Acts where the Bible says, um, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whoever calls on the name and is circumcised, whoever calls on the name and prays in tongues, whoever calls on the name and is serving a church, whoever calls on the name and is serving and is tithing and is doing these things, whoever calls on the name and is whoever. No, it says whoever calls on the name of the Lord, period, will be saved. Whoever calls, and I I, I come here this morning hoping to free a whole lot of us from the burdens that we feel that hinder us from fully walking in the love of God, that hinder us from fully experiencing the love of God. And I come here to plead with you that just give him your heart, let him touch your heart. And from that place, you will be able to do all these other things. From that place, you will be able to do a whole lot of these things because he will teach you how to love him. He will teach you how to love him. And so I pray that we go back, go back to the beginning, go back to the basics and say, God, so many things have happened. I've been serving in church for 10 years. There's been so many things that right now I don't have much love for you. I'm burdened by so many things that right now I don't really know if I love you that much, God. So I come back and ask, circumcise my heart and teach me how to love you right. And remember, it's easy. It's a matter of belief. The process of circumcision might be painful because God has to take out the ugly. He has to remove the ugly. He has to take out the hurt and all these things. But allow him to do that. Because from that place, you will learn to love your father. You will learn to love your father and it won't feel like a burden. It won't feel like a burden. Because he'd have taught you how to love him. And so what does, what does it look like? Right? What does this circumcision mean? You're going off about circumcision of the heart. But what does it actually look like? What do I do? Like, What needs to happen from here on? We'll read Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 27. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 27. Um, 
God is speaking, right? Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 27, God is speaking to Ezekiel. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water, from verse 25, sorry. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my ordinances and do them. You will live in the land that I gave to your fathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. So here's what God is saying. He says, listen, I will give you a new heart. He says, I will cleanse you and give you a new heart and remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then it says, and then I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And obey my ordinances. God prioritizes a change of heart before anything else. Because he says, I will give you a new heart. I will take out your heart of stone, put in a heart of flesh. And then from that place, I will teach you how to observe my ordinances. I will teach you how to walk in my statutes. I will teach you how to live life the way i require life to be lived but first i must deal with your heart and last night as i was in prayer truly there was such there was such a big guys there was such a burden on my heart and god was saying a lot of my children are walking around with hearts of stone with hearts of stone because of something they experienced within the body of christ He says, a lot of my children are walking around with hearts of stone, not because they don't know me, not because they they don't believe in me, but it's because they were told they have to do a million things just for me to love them. And so they walk around with hearts of stone. They walk around with hearts of stone. And you find people who've been in the church 10, 15 years having their hearts hardening by the year because it seems like it's all these other practices that make God love us. It seems like it's all these practices that allow us to be children of God. And right now, this morning, I just came to ask you, to plead with you, to just let God come into your heart. Before anything else, let him come and change your heart. Allowing circumcision of the heart, what that looks like is now going back to God after this Bible study, sitting down and saying, God, this is the condition of my heart. This is where I am. This is where I've been hurt. And then surrendering the hurt to him, surrendering the the, the pain to him. And saying, God, this is the the condition of my heart. My heart is a stone. My heart is a stone. And God here is saying, you're going to need a heart of flesh in order to observe my ordinances. You're going to need a heart of flesh in order to walk in my statutes. For me and you to walk together, you need a heart of flesh. But you're walking around with a heart of stone. Because of hurt and and disappointment and a whole lot of things that have happened in your life, you are walking around with a heart of stone. And God says, "Let let me give you a heart of flesh. Let me pour out my spirit into you. Let me circumcise your heart and teach you how to love me. Let me teach you how to love me. He's saying your problem is not obedience. Your problem is not that you don't want to read your word. Your problem is not that you don't want to pray. Your problem is you don't know how to love me. Your problem is you are coming with a heart of stone and you are forcing a heart of stone to do flesh activities. You are forcing a heart of stone to do the work that requires a heart of flesh. And that's why it feels like a burden. That's why it feels burdensome. Because you come from a place of hurt. 
and you're wanting to produce new wine from, from a place of hurt, from all the wine skins, you're trying to produce new wine. And God says, let me first, let's first, let's do the first things first. Right? Let's do the first things first. Let me circumcise your heart. Surrender the hurts, the pain. Bring everything. Be honest with God. Bring everything to God and say, God, this is the condition of my heart. God is not afraid of us. He's not afraid of what's happening inside. He's not. So bring your heart and say, God, this is the condition of my heart. I want to love you, right? I want to do the right thing by, by you. But this is what my heart looks like. And so help my heart, heal my heart, give me a heart of flesh, soften my heart. A lot of us are even hardened towards God, towards people because of the hurt. And say, God, soften my heart. A lot of us, are, are, we have so many toxic habits in our heart as a way to protect our heart. And we say, God, the walls, the many, many walls that I've built up around my heart, here is my heart, soften my heart, and then teach me how to love you right. Teach me, God, how to love you right. So that's what it looks like. It looks like going to God and giving him our hearts and saying, God, this is the reality of what is going on. I know I'm happy, bubbly. Everybody sees me happy and all these things. But the truth is I am operating from a place of hurt. I'm operating from a place of feeling burdened. I'm operating from this place of anger. This thing happened at church five years ago and it's still the place that I'm operating from. This has made me hardened. It has made me angry. Right? It has made me angry. That's the first thing that we can do in order to allow circumcision is surrendering and going to God and say, God, take my heart of stone. Give me a heart of flesh. Pour your spirit into me. Pour your spirit into me. That then I may observe your principles and your law and live according to how you want to live. The second thing is Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. What does circumcision of the heart look like? Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The second thing is to pursue purity above everything else. Pursue purity of heart above everything else. And we only think of purity when it comes to sexual sin, right? We're like, yeah, I'm walking in purity because we're not having sex. A lot of us are walking impure. In, a lot of us have impure hearts because our intentions daily are impure. Our intentions daily are. It's not just because we're, a lot of us not having sex, but are impure in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our intentions. And God says, yeah, simply put, he says, you want to see me pursue purity in your heart. Straightforward, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. What do you mean? It's not that I'm praying in tongues that I'll see God. It's not that I'm serving five, 10 hours at church that I'll see God. It's not that I'm praying for people and I'm doing all these things. Is that not what will cause me to see God? And God is like, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Yes, you are praying for people, but what's the intention of your heart? Yes, you are serving, but what's the intention of your heart? What's the condition of your heart? And so that circumcision is saying, God, purify me. And we don't like that, right? Because that process of purification is ugly. It is ugly. But to see God... We need to pursue purity of heart. And so that, that, that circumcision of the heart is saying, God, purify my heart. Because we underestimate the, the evil that resides in our hearts. We really do. We are very, very... Yo, we are evil. We are evil as human beings. Our hearts are filled with like evil things. And we underestimate that a lot. A lot. And a lot of our intentions don't come from a good place. But because we are Christians, we think, yeah, everything I do come. No, a lot of the things we do don't even come from a good place. And so it's praying and saying, God, purify my heart. Purify my heart so that everything I do for you comes from a pure heart. Because you said, I am blessed because I'm pure in heart. Because that's when I will see you. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 
blessed are the pure in heart but they will see god so how do we walk out this circumcision it's purely surrendering to god and saying god here is the condition of my heart and secondly saying god put me through that purification process if it means i will see you we have to be willing to go through the hard process if it means that we will see god and it's gonna be ugly i can tell you now for free (laughs) it's gonna be ugly but it's worth it if it means you will see god it's worth it if it means that we will get to see god and so that's what the apostles are advocating for a change of heart a circumcision of the heart and then they give them a couple of rules like oh okay don't drink these things don't eat meat that was strangled a couple of those things and then paul and barnabas go back to the gentiles with that letter and they say hey you don't have to be circumcised, so yay, just as long as you believe in God. But still, just don't eat these things and don't do those things and don't, so that you know you are also still walking in, you're walking in purity. And that literally wraps up um, verse chapter 15. And then at the end, Paul and Barnabas go their separate ways because they get into a little dispute. Um, so yeah, that kind of, you can read Please do read the rest of Acts chapter 15. It's really good. But we're going to end there because the really the, the heart behind today's Bible study or the messaging was that circumcision of the heart. And I felt it very important, especially where we are at right now. Like right now we're at a point in the Bible study or in the challenge rather where it gets, it's getting difficult, right? It's not just like super easy. It's like getting tough to wake up and do and keep up and do all these things. But it did. We've learned today that it's through circumcision of the heart that will allow us to love God right. And from that place, we'll be able to engage in all these things because we love him. Because we love him and because he's taught us how to love him. So we're going to take two, three minutes. I know we're a little bit over time. We're going to take two, three minutes and just pray that prayer of surrender and saying, God, I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you everything. Purify me. Do what only you can do. And I really, really encourage us to really Go before the Lord. Um, Go before the Lord and pray and say, Lord, here is my heart. Here is the condition of my heart. Help me. Help me. Teach me how to love you. Circumcise my heart and teach you and teach me how to love you. So let's just take some time in prayer and then we will wrap up. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning, mighty Father God. We come before you this morning, Lord Jesus, to say thank you. You will have our hearts, mighty Father God. You will have our very, very beautiful hearts, mighty Father God. That even when we didn't know how to love you, you still loved us, mighty Father God. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, mighty Father God, praying a prayer of surrender, Lord bringing our hearts before you father and saying lord here we are here we are before you god broken hurt confused lord our hearts are hurt and broken father god we bring them and surrender them to you oh god that mighty father god you can just come and transform and change us mighty father god we no longer hold on to the pain we no longer hold on to the anger but god we lay it all we lay all before your feet, we lay it all before your throne, mighty Father God, and pray, mighty Father God, this morning that you come into our hearts and change us, God, circumcise our hearts, mighty Father God, that we may know how to love you, God, we we want to love you right, we want to do it the right way, God, but change our hearts first in order to love you right, Father God, Heavenly Father, lead us lead us into a place of purification father god purify our hearts father purify our hearts from all the evil intention and desires of this heart the lord god may be able to see you god that we may be able to see you and love you right mighty father god heavenly father we submit and surrender ourselves to you this morning mighty father god we surrender everything to you god we surrender everything to you, Father. We yield every part of us to you, God. We yield it all to you, God. Every part, every pain, every hurt, Lord Jesus. We bring it before you, God. 
the Lord God take us back to our first love. Take us back to the place where we first met you. Take us back to the simplicity of the gospel, Father. The simplicity of loving you, God. The simplicity of how much you love us. That is only belief, Lord God. It only takes belief. It only takes confession for you to love us, God. You loved us before we even loved you, mighty Father God. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning. Yielding our hearts to you, God. Bringing our hearts to you, God. You are the only one that can change us. You are the only one that can give us a heart of flesh, Lord. Take this heart of stone, God. The walls that are built up around my heart, God, I bring them to you. Lord, cause them to crumble that I may know you. The walls that are built up, that are keeping you out, God, cause them to crumble so you may come in. Cleanse my heart, oh God. Cleanse my heart, oh Father. That I may love you right, God. Lord, we come this morning just to surrender ourselves to you, God. We surrender ourselves. We yield our hearts to you, God. We want to love you right. We want to love you right, God. We want to please you. You are the only one whose validation matters. We are performing for the audience of one, which is you, God. So, Lord God, we pray this morning that Jesus, that you just come into this place, come into our hearts, and truly do as you please, Lord. Oh, we love you, God. We love you, God. We want you, God. We want to see you, God. Thank you that you are moving, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus, that you are moving and working in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. Um, yeah. <laughs> amen. Just need a couple of minutes. Um, but I really encourage us to continue in prayer and in the same spirit. And after, just immediately as this ends, sit down with God and show Him the condition of your heart. He already knows, but show Him and be honest, be vulnerable with God. And allow Him to see. Allow Him to see. And then allow Him to bring about transformation in your life. Because He wants to. And allow Him to teach you how to love Him. So yeah, I hope <laughs> I hope this was helpful. <laughs> I hope we, we had a good time. I had a good time. I think it's so beautiful and the presence of the Holy Spirit is so sweet. Um but yeah, thank you, thank you for taking the time and being in this place and waking up and joining Bible study. So tomorrow it's church. Um, so please find a church near you and go to church and then we meet again Monday morning at 5am for our prayers so thank you so much for waking up taking the time joining this Bible study continue spending time in the Lord this Bible study will be up here on Instagram and I'll post it on YouTube as well and yeah thank you guys so much have a lovely restful Saturday and I will see you Monday morning. Bye.